those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we catch up with two of the activists who attended a series of meetings in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago with members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Senate's Committee on the Environment and Public Works. Dr. Marvin Reznikoff, Senior Associate at Radioactive Waste Management Associates, talks about what the NRC does not know about high burn-up fuel, and it's enough to burn any of us up. Then Diane De Rigo of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NEARS, reports on the EPA meeting on the lack of radiation monitoring on the West Coast in the days, weeks, months, and years after Fukushima. Plus, we're going to have Num Nuts of the Week and the Radcast Radiation Weather Report. All of these coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday. January 28, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Breaking news today that the planned sentencing hearing in federal court in Knoxville, Tennessee, for three peaceful nuclear disarmament activists, including 84-year-old Buddhist nun Sister Megan Rice, was delayed until February 18 after a winter storm forced early closure of the courthouse. Mother Nature is not siding with the courts on this one. The defendants have remained in federal custody since their May 2013 conviction on charges of sabotage and criminal damage at the Y-12 nuclear weapons plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. To recap their heinous crime, on July 28th of 2012, the three veteran activists hiked over a ridge and cut through four fences to reach the United States' new storehouse for bomb-grade, highly enriched uranium, this at the Y-12 nuclear weapons complex. There, their crime consisted of stringing crime scene tape between two pillars, pouring blood on the walls, lighting candles, and hanging two banners reading Transform Now Plowshares and Swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, Isaiah. When the first security officer arrived on the scene, the trio broke bread to share as a peace offering. Now these three are back in jail and will remain there until February 18th when they are sentenced. There is a petition asking the judge for leniency in this case, and we will provide a link at nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode 136. Even mainstream media is picking up on the story of radioactive seawater from Fukushima expected to hit Southern California beaches this summer and continue flowing until 2016. According to Stephen Manley, who is professor of biology at Cal State Long Beach and the head of Kelpwatch, a testing system for the health of the ocean, as every year passes, it meaning the radiation, becomes more diluted, but it also becomes more widespread. People should know the amount of radioactive material in the kelp. I think the amount will be small, but small doesn't mean insignificant. If it gets into the kelp, it's probably pretty pervasive in all the other organisms in the community, meaning the food chain. Alaska is high up in the nuclear news this week, and they are kicking and screaming every step of the way. Alaska's Local Environmental Observers Network writes that a hunter reported that he had caught a spotted seal that he thought was sick. We'll have some debate over that one at another time. But the important thing is that he gutted the animal and found that there was white pus or a goo-like substance along the muscle tissue. 
everywhere. The very small bit of the fat was chewed on and nothing else. He said, We have crows. They are known to eat just about anything, even silicone, off the roof. This animal is not being touched. At the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, held January 20th through 24th, it was reported that ice seals, the ringed, bearded, and spotted seals, and Pacific walrus are being found to have unusual, if not unprecedented, illnesses. Incidental gross findings among these three species included lesions of the reproductive system, including uterine and penile melanosis. Sounds like cancer of the private parts. The endocrine system showed thyroid cysts and adrenal nodules. There were problems with cysts in the musculoskeletal system. The digestive system had pancreatitis, jaundice, and other illnesses I cannot even pronounce. Meanwhile, the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation is not actively testing fish for radiation, according to Commissioner Larry Hartig, who told the Canadian Senate, the state is relying on data and analyses from other coastal states, British Columbia, and federal agencies. Hartig said in an interview that the department tests fish regularly, just not for radiation. He said it would be too expensive for the state to undertake a testing program that would be statistically valid, his phrase, and he's concerned that people are being misinformed. Yes, they are being misinformed by idiots like you who withhold information. In true numbnuts fashion, Commissioner Hartig said, you get more radiation risk from eating a banana. Ah, the old banana canard which is countered by Stephen Starr, director of the Clinical Laboratory Science Program at the University of Missouri, who states unequivocally, cesium-137, which is the predominant radionuclide that we have found from Fukushima, cesium-137 emits 10 million times more radiation per unit volume than does the potassium-40 found in a banana. So Alaska, go slip on a banana peel. But you need to do the testing. I used to think I wanted to travel or even live in Alaska, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Dr. Ken Busler of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution says the U.S. government has failed the public by not testing the Pacific for radiation and labels this act historical weirdness. He said, when we went to offer our service to go out and help out, We didn't have an agency in this country that really had an interest. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, was given the authority to look at this disaster and see what the U.S. response should be. Their reaction was to continue this modeling effort, not on-the-ground field efforts. They said, we don't measure radionuclides. Then they'd point to the Department of Energy. But the DOE tends only to focus their resources and expertise on land and groundwater, not the general spread of radionuclides in the marine environment. Buechler went on to point out, Here we have in our country many reactors on oceans and don't even have an authority or body that has a mission that includes the fate of those radionuclides in the ocean. I think that's a failure that we still haven't solved. Here's a story that relates directly to our interview today. When the radiation plume from Fukushima was supposed to hit North America, there were no functioning radnet monitors instituted by the EPA on the central coast. Daniel Hirsch of the Committee to Bridge the Gap said the EPA was going to deploy portable monitors. But according to an email that Hirsch obtained with a Freedom of Information Act request, quote, EPA... HQ headquarters has decided at this time to not deploy the deployable radnet monitors to California, Oregon, or Washington, end quote. So at the height of the emergency, the central coast, the very spot where the radioactive plume was supposed to hit, the EPA had no working monitors for air quality in Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Luis Obispo, or Santa Barbara counties. Hirsch said we do know from a monitor in Bakersfield, before it broke in mid-March, that radioactive air quality 
was spiking. And who was in charge of the RadNet monitor system during that time? Why, Gina McCarthy, who just happens to be the current head of the EPA. Thanks, Gina. Whose side are you on anyway? Well, there are lots of candidates this week, but there's room for only one. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of the week. The National Cancer Institute is set to begin what could be a years-long study of the health effects of the 1945 Trinity Site atomic test on New Mexico residents. That's right, they're doing this nearly 70 years after the first detonation that ushered in the atomic age. So, in other words, an infant born on the day that Trinity exploded would be five years into full Social Security benefits if they're still alive. Our government doesn't want to know the truth. They can't handle the truth. But J. Robert Oppenheimer knew what he was saying when on Trinity Day, watching the blast, he said, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. According to Tina Cordova, a cancer survivor who grew up in Tularosa and is now leader of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, this has been a long time coming. We were unwilling, unknowing, and uncompensated participants in the world's largest science experiment. And Tina, only now, when it's too late to help the majority of people who are harmed by this, is the government stepping in to find out, gee, I wonder what happened. Do we have to wait another 35 years for them to look into what happened at Three Mile Island? Of, by, and for the people, my ass. Nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Two quick pieces of good news from the states before we move on. In January, James Merritt, a Republican senator from Indiana, drafted a new bill designed to promote construction of nuclear energy projects in Indiana, a state without any operating commercial nuclear facilities. Well, it's going to stay that way. Last Tuesday, Senator Merritt withdrew Senate Bill 302 and announced the bill would not be considered currently largely because no utility showed interest in starting a new nuclear project in Indiana. It looks like knowledgeable investors and lenders have always been more intimidated by the financial risks of cancellation and cost overruns of nuclear than motivated by the potential limited gains. And America's last active uranium mill near Blanding in San Juan County, Utah, announced plans to shut down for at least a year, beginning in August of 2014. Energy Fuels Resources, the owner of the mill, announced it will also be idling its controversial uranium mines near the Grand Canyon. Woohoo! Congratulations to Wind Euler and all the activists who worked on that in the Southwest. Over to Japan, where the gloves are coming off in the Tokyo gubernatorial election. Former Prime Minister Morihiro Hosokawa, who is running for that post on an anti-nuclear platform, said, The myth that nuclear power is clean and safe has collapsed. Restarting nuclear reactors while we still have no place to dispose nuclear waste is a criminal act towards future generations. The severity of risks associated with nuclear power is high. We have to switch to renewable and environmentally friendly energies and lead the world in that field. So how is this story being handled by Japanese media? According to freelance TV and radio commentator Peter Barakan, he's been pressured by two broadcast stations to steer clear of nuclear power issues on his programs until after the Tokyo gubernatorial election on February 9. Barakan mentioned the requests on his live show on Monday but did not identify the stations. He did later say, Somebody needs to bring these issues into the media. Writing on Fukushima for Russia's pro-atom magazine, Oleg Devoynikov, the editor-in-chief, wrote, It's bad the Japanese won't let any foreign experts visit the station, meaning Fukushima Daiichi. And there were offers of help, not only from Russia, but from many other countries, too. 
Even if the soil around the nuclear power plant is totally frozen, this won't fully eliminate the danger. I believe that the liquidation of the Fukushima accident's consequences might have been much better organized if the works were managed not by the company that operates the Fukushima plant, but by the Japanese government. And when it comes to nuclear accidents, who would know better than the Russians? As regards spent fuel rod removal from Unit 4, in case you've forgotten about it, CBS, in an interview on January 27th with a TEPCO spokesmodel, used Arnie Gunderson's analogy and said about the fuel rod removal, this is like removing a cigarette from a crushed pack, to which TEPCO's representative responded, take that analogy and imagine it's like the cigarette in the box is lit. So reassuring. So how badly is TEPCO suffering as a result of this ongoing planetary disaster in Fukushima? This was unearthed by Yorimo Chizuki, our friend with Fukushima Diary, that according to TEPCO's earnings forecast, the consolidated ordinary profit of fiscal year 2013 would be 57 billion yen. That's more than five and a half billion American dollars. Not bad for a company that's destroying the planet. And another little nugget from Fukushima Diary. Google Trends is showing more and more Japanese are searching the words losing hair since 2011. While the connection with March 11, 2011 and the Fukushima disaster is unclear, the graph shows the significant trend change early in 2011. And we caught up with an insightful story in the International New York Times from the 12th of January. It's about a rancher in the Fukushima district defying evacuation orders in order to tend to the cows that have been left behind. It's by New York Times Tokyo Bureau Chief Martin Fackler, and I found it a fascinating read with some very subtle information in it. We will have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode number 136. We'll also be posting a link to democracynow.org because Amy Goodman took her crew over there and spent more than a week interviewing people from Japan about Fukushima. Great reports. Check them out for yourself. On the international front, Canada's nuclear establishment. And yes, Americans, Canada is a foreign country. But their nuclear establishment is defending its disputed plan to truck intensely radioactive liquid weapons-grade uranium through eastern Ontario to and through the United States. Pending multiple federal approvals in Canada and the U.S., about 23,000 liters of nitric acid solution containing suspended particles of highly enriched uranium are to be secretly transported under armed guard from the Chalk River Nuclear Laboratories in Ontario to the U.S. government's Savannah River site in South Carolina for reprocessing. It would take at least 179 separate shipments to move the entire contents. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States and Canada's Federal Nuclear Safety Commission are in the midst of the approval process. Approval? Don't you think that the states of, at minimum, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, which stand between South Carolina's Savannah River site and Ontario, deserve to have a say in this process? And speaking of Ontario, that's where Blinky strikes again. Third Eye Louie, a fish with three eyes, has been caught in Calendar Bay in Ontario. This was on January 19th. Derek Warmington was on a fishing expedition with his son Brandon when his son caught a pickerel with a third eye. This is in Lake Nipissing. Warmington asked, Is there a nuclear reactor or toxins in the lake to cause this? Why don't you just check to see if you're anywhere near Chalk River? In Jamaica, Mon, customs authorities have revealed that in the last 13 months, tests conducted at the nation's ports have confirmed the presence of higher-than-normal levels of radiation in two shipments from Japan. 
This discovery came only days after Russian authorities barred 132 used Japanese vehicles from entering that country because of, quote, radioactive pollution concerns. Here's the irony. The U.S. doesn't test, but Jamaica, through a partnership with the United States Department of Energy, has been conducting radiation tests on all vehicles and spare parts coming from Japan. A spokesperson said, We have received sophisticated radiation detection equipment and have been adequately trained in its use. So why don't we do that here in the States? Rhetorical. Radio 105 in Switzerland bought yellowfin tuna from both the co-op, one of Switzerland's main supermarket chains, and Globus, a department store, and sent it to the state laboratory in Basel for study. The result? Cesium-134 and cesium-137 were found in both samples measured by gamma spectrometry. These isotopes do not occur in nature. They are related to nuclear fission. The fish came from the Philippines. And in the category of, you've got to be kidding me, France, that bastion of all things gastronomique, has hosted a Parisian event to promote the safety of agricultural and marine products from Fukushima. It was a joint effort of the city of Paris and the Fukushima prefectural government and took place on January 27 with some 120 people in attendance. This included French restaurateurs and members of a Fukushima nuclear apologist support group based in Paris. Of course you want produce and fish from Fukushima. It cooks itself. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your donations to keep going, growing, and improving. If you enjoy the news, interviews, numbnuts of the week, and all the rest, help me keep this program going. There's the donate button on the homepage at nuclearhotseat.com. Please use it, and thank you. Now today's interviews. Radiation is in the news and on people's mind, and that's why a group of top activists got together in Washington, D.C. to meet with individual Nuclear Regulatory Commission commissioners, the Environmental Protection Agency, and representatives of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Today, I bring you first-person reports from two of our representatives. The first, Dr. Marvin Reznikoff, is Senior Associate at Radioactive Waste Management Associates and has been an international consultant on radioactive waste management for decades. Marvin Reznikoff, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Pleased to be here. You recently attended a series of high-level meetings in Washington between anti-nuclear activists and individual members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, and representatives of members of Congress who sit on the Senate Committee on the Environment and Public Works. First of all, what was the strategy behind holding these meetings and doing so at this time? We were trying to inform members of the Senate and about high burn-up fuel, fuel that's been sitting in the reactor for longer, much longer periods of time than had previously been accomplished. And that's what we did in the Senate. And for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we wanted to get information from them. We wanted to find out if they're aware of high burn-up fuel, if they could tell us when high burn-up fuel was actually authorized, in particular at San Onofre, when was it ever authorized, and, and what was the database that they based their decision on. That was really what we went to Washington for. Give us a brief summary of the issues involved with high burn-up fuel so that the listeners can understand the importance of this issue. Okay, I have to step back a second uh, and describe uh, what happens in a nuclear reactor. I hope this doesn't put your listeners to sleep. Nuclear fuel consists of uranium, which is stacked as pellets within a rod of cladding, and those rods are then bundled together into what's called a fuel assembly. And those rods sit in a reactor Previously, they would sit in a reactor for four and a half years. Each one and a half year, they would take out a third of the reactor core. But more recently, 
what's been happening is they've been allowing the fuel to sit in the reactor for six years, two years at a time. And the effect is the fuel is much hotter, contains much more radioactivity in it, like cesium. And our concern has been with the cladding itself. Just to put it in perspective, just so you get a feel for this, the cladding, which wraps around this stack of pellets, uranium pellets, is not much thicker than heavy-duty aluminum foil. It's extremely thin material. And over time, in the reactor, the fuel comes in contact with this uh, cladding. The cladding gets thinner over time, and the cladding cracks. Uh, and that's been our main concern, that the cladding is not only, uh, not only cracks, but becomes more brittle. And therefore, when it's handled, or if in a nuclear transportation accident, the cladding could actually shatter. And so the cladding doesn't serve as a barrier anymore if there's an accident. Those are the issues that concern us. The fact that this cladding becomes brittle, cladding is thinner, and it, the cladding cracks over time. And the issues are the NRC has not actually done the tests. They've essentially allowed the industry, because of the economics of nuclear power, the fact that it's becoming so threatened by natural gas, the industry has moved toward high burn-up fuel and has moved towards stuffing more nuclear fuel into these dry storage casks at reactor sites. And that's all to save a few pennies. This continues to be such an unbelievable short-sightedness on the part of the industry. So let's get back to these meetings. I take it that high burn-up fuel has not been part of the general discussion with the NRC and, and activists until relatively recently. That's exactly right. Essentially, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has just allowed the industry to proceed based on studies not for high burnout fuel, but for low burnout fuel. And that's our concern. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission oversight hasn't really looked at what happens in high burn -up, with high burnout fuel. And they're only now catching up on that. One of the meetings, the NRC said, well, we're doing studies now at at Oak Ridge, and we should have the results next week. And uh, we said, but you're continuing to allow the industry to use high burnout fuel without it actually doing the safety studies in advance. Huh. Your first meeting at the NRC was with the technical staff. How did that go? That was extremely contentious. I was surprised. I thought we were just going to have an informal give and take but the person that we wanted to talk to brought in five other technical people, brought in a lawyer, brought in a PR person. I was extremely surprised. I thought we were just going to have an informal meeting. Maybe for the NRC that is an informal meeting. In any case, the, the meeting was extremely contentious. The NRC, well, we took notes, you know, but nothing is, was recorded in these meetings. None of these meetings uh, actually were recorded. I talked about transportation, and the NRC staff says, well, we don't care if there's no cladding. We don't care if it's just rubble inside these canisters. Those were their words. This was said by somebody in a position of authority at the NRC, or at least some responsibility for this material? Well, one of the more knowledgeable people, a fellow named Bob Einziger, who's really one of the more knowledgeable people about spent fuel cladding, He's a material scientist. And he doesn't care. He said it's not a safety concern. And I said, well, yes, it is. If there's an accident, then material can more easily get out of the container. The transportation specialist jumped in and said, well, you know, what kind of accident are you talking about? And I then would describe an accident, a train sill hitting a side of a casket at a train crossing. And they said, well, if we have that kind of accident, we don't care what kind of cladding it is. It would all break up. Oh, that's so reassuring. 
Did they express any kind of concern or taking seriously or anything that wasn't contentious towards the points that you and the others were trying to make? Well, they said that they have studies that are coming out. Oak Ridge is doing some studies about spent fuel cladding, and, and that should be ready in a week or two. I mean, that was their response to it. Did you feel that there was any progress made at all in terms of their awareness, or was this perhaps just the agency saying, go pat them on the heads and say, they're their children, we'll listen to you and then ignore you? No, 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 no. There was no patting on the head children. They were extremely defensive. Look, I've been working on radioactive waste transportation issues since 1975, it's not like I was, you know, born yesterday on this issue, and I'm a physicist. I started work on this in 75 for Attorney General Lefkowitz in New York State when they were actually flying liquid plutonium out of Kennedy Airport in containers that could only withstand a 30-foot drop. <sighs> Planes fly higher than 30 feet, but uh, the NRC was resistant to that until finally Congress said, you design black boxes for airplanes that survive crashes. You can design a plutonium container that could withstand air crashes. And then the NRC did that. But it's not easy for outsiders outside the NRC to actually tell the NRC what to do. After this tech staff meeting took place with its less than optimum results, what meetings followed with the NRC? Well, then we had a meeting with Chairman McFarlane, a one-hour meeting, and then we had a half-hour meeting with uh, one of the commissioners, Apostolakis. And I would say those meetings were much more, I don't know, positive. In what uh, way positive? The chair listened to us, took notes, though she's only one out of five votes on, uh, you know, the commission. She's in favor of storage. She's in favor of removing fuel from reactor pools and putting it into dry storage. But she's only one vote out of five. Her Ph.D. thesis was on dry storage. So she's much more knowledgeable on these issues. But we'll see how it goes. My general feeling is it's not the NRC that you're, you're actually going to convince. Uh, you have to convince the Senate. You know, will they then tell the NRC what to do, the nuclear oversight committees? And, and then we, we did have some meetings with staff for these various committees that oversee the NRC. Let's take a step back for a second. Was there any significant difference in the meeting that you had with Apostolakis? No, actually, uh, he was gentlemanly. Uh, is that is that <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you were being managed and handled. You know, he listened to us. Frankly, I, I'm not sure how up he was on high burn-up fuel. The chair was much more up on this issue, and she had a staff person who was extremely knowledgeable as well in the room. Can you think of anything that we can add to this that would be helpful just in terms of summarizing what happened in D.C., whether you think it was useful and how we might be able to build upon it? I think it's, it's useful to maintain contact with the NRC, yes. There needs to be continual follow-up uh, with the NRC to show them that people are watching. They're going to come out with various studies, and then, then we're going to take a look at them. Well, when you find inconsistencies or things to comment upon, we would welcome you back on Nuclear Hot Seat to share that information with us as well. Be happy to. Well, then we went to meetings with Senate staff, and this is Senate staff that oversees uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I look at those meetings as a little more useful. You were meeting with representatives from the offices of Senators Boxer, Markey, Wyden, and Sanders. Is that correct? That's correct. So how were they more useful meetings in your estimation? Even though you think, and I think, the Congress does nothing, they actually are quite busy. The staff are anyway. They are pulled in any number of directions. So it was good to focus their attention on uh, this issue. Some of these staff have been around for a long time, and they were extremely helpful telling us how to get through the thicket, this legislative thicket. Now, for instance... 
We want to know how much high burn-up fuel there is at, at all the reactors around the country. Just that simple question. We were surprised when we asked Chair McFarland for that information. She says, we don't have it. <laughs> we said, this is so easy. Each reactor site, you know, they have a book that says this fuel assembly sits in this slot in the fuel pool. They know exactly where all the fuel is. What can only hope? Well, they have to in order to know how much fuel to put into a cask. They can't overheat the cask. They're limited to the total heat that they can put into a container. So they have to know this. And the inspectors have to know this. And so they only need to ask. We were surprised that they don't have this information. Actually, the Department of Energy right now is gathering this information. The last time they actually got this information was the year 2003. So it's been 11 years. You know, they could hire a temp or a virtual assistant and just put them on making the calls and the email and asking for reports and get all that information at least in process in a very short period of time. So this lapse seems to be that they weren't even looking or they weren't even aware of the need for this statistic. Yeah, that's all true. And it's, I think, necessary for Congress to focus them on this issue And the staff said that they definitely would look into that. The staff asked that we draft some letters that they can look at and revise and send to the Department of Energy and the NRC. So that will be very helpful. At least we'll find out how much high burn-up fuel there is at reactor sites. And our understanding is all reactors right now are spitting out high burn-up fuel, all reactors in the country. So I have one last question for you. If the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat were to follow up on these meetings and add to the effectiveness so that they aren't just a single blip that happened, but part of an ongoing build of awareness and effectiveness for our perspective, what do you suggest that we could do? The first thing is at each reactor site, they should write their senator and Ask them how much high burn of fuel there is at their reactor. I think it, it would be very positive if a lot of letters came into Congress uh, and, and the Senate, that is, asking this question, because that would focus the Senate on the issue. I think that's a very doable strategy to take. And I'll have information for that up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode number 136. Any last words? Um, well, I just, I just want to go back to the, the beginning of our conversation, which is it, it is amazing to me that the NRC, who's supposed to be the regulators, is essentially asleep at the switch. They should have been on top of this issue. They should have been examining the safety aspects of this issue before they approve using high burn-up fuel in reactors, not after. Marvin, I want to thank you for the work you've been doing for all these years while so many of us weren't even looking in the direction of nuclear. What have you been doing if you've not been looking at this? Living a life with blinders on that only came off at Fukushima. Like so many others, but, you know, better late than never. Yeah. Dr. Marvin Reznikov. Here with her take on the meeting with the Environmental Protection Agency is Diane DeRigo, Radioactive Waste Project Director for the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NEARS. Diane DeRigo, thank you so much for being on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for inviting me. You attended the meeting with the Environmental Protection Agency that took place between activists and the agency in the recent past. Tell us what your goal was in attending this meeting and what you wanted to put forth. The Environmental Protection Agency has responsibility for protecting the public from ionizing radiation overall. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission licenses nuclear facilities, nuclear power reactors, radiation facilities, and even doctor's offices 
with X-ray machines and so forth. But when it comes to off-site from where the Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensees are, it's the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that is supposed to protect the public. So when Fukushima happened, and we knew that radioactivity was coming across in the jet stream and eventually in the water supply, it's the EPA that's supposed to be notifying and protecting the public. They're also supposed to be notifying and protecting us from the routine releases that come from nuclear facilities. And all nuclear facilities routinely give off radioactivity. They cannot function in a clean and zero-release fashion. They just can't. And that's why the agencies make regulations to legalize the contamination that comes from nuclear power fuel chain. So the meeting that we had with the Environmental Protection Agency had several goals. One was to find out the latest update on some of the weakening on radiation protection that EPA has been doing and to see how bad that's going to be. And then the other was to call for better monitoring, better notification of the public, specifically real-time online monitoring reporting so that we could have knowledge like we have of what the temperature is, what the pollen count is, what the air quality is, that we would know the amount of radioactivity that is in the air and in the environment. This was one of the things that we called for, and of course it's much more than they were ready to agree with. It's well known to some of us in the community exactly how shamefully inadequate, and that's really an understatement, the EPA's performance was after Fukushima. Can you reflect on that for a moment just to bring yes. us up to speed on what happened? Yes. As a remnant of the old bomb testing era and nuclear weapons causing radioactivity to go throughout the atmosphere, the Environmental Protection Agency set up and has running about 100 monitors that they report online on a thing called RADnet. And it's a real difficult system to read and understand. It's my understanding that the old data is not saved and it's not accessible if it hasn't been destroyed or lost. So we have something of a monitoring system that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency runs right now. And people could, if they were very sophisticated, go and get some data from what's going on. But they only have 100 points in the whole country. So you may get a point in Denver, but if you live 50 miles or 30 miles away, it's going to be different. Even a mile away from a monitor or even next to a monitor could be different. So the kind of monitoring that's going on is not really adequate. What happened when Fukushima started, and I say that because it is continuing, uh, in March of 2011 is that the EPA put out more monitors but then did not turn them on so that the current system is running still, but it's not giving us as much as if they had used the more backup monitors. And we don't really know why or who made the decision to not turn those monitors on. The other thing is that nuclear reactors, this is sort of jumping a little to what our meeting was calling for, nuclear reactors routinely give off radioactivity. And as I said, the government has given them legal contamination levels. So what we were asking for is that the routine releases at every nuclear reactor be reported in real time. And this is something that was a new thought for them. So this is going to be an uphill battle. But it's something that I'm hearing around not just nuclear power, but any kind of nuclear facilities, a nuclear fuel chain, mining and milling and fuel fabrication. There are many steps to make nuclear fuel that goes in the reactor, and then you've got the waste that's there forever after. And there's not any real system in place to notify the public, to even keep track themselves, let alone notify the public. So it was a double ask. One is start keeping track and check for not just alpha, beta, gamma, what the radioactivity is, but what the isotopes, the actual elements are that are coming out. And one of the groups, which is tracking nuclear routine releases and accidental releases from the TVA reactors, the Tennessee Valley Authority, they were asking that there be some kind of dye that's added to the releases so that both into air and water when radioactivity is released there would be some coloring agent so people could see that there was radioactivity in the air and water and this is a conceptual 
call. There was a call for this a few years ago that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission dismissed. And it would be similar to having a smell in gas, you know, so you can smell gas. It's not naturally a smell. So this would be coloration. These sound like logical, rational steps to ask the EPA to do to fulfill what they're supposed to be doing, which is protecting us. What was the response in the room? How were these suggestions met? We had uh, about five officials, let's see, one, two, three, four national staff and people pretty high up within the EPA in our meeting, and they said it was interesting and they would think about it, and they looked said that they'd look at the references that were provided. And then we had one regional person from one of the EPA regional offices who also agreed to meet and further discuss the routine releases from Indian Point, the nuclear power reactors in New York, and, and some of the other ones in that region. There was not any kind of a commitment. They listened politely and said they would think about it. The other thing that we were asking for has to do with EPA's potentially imminent weakening of water standards. In 2013, the Environmental Protection Agency adopted and opened for public comment what they call protective action guides. These are emergency responses. These are responses to a nuclear disaster, a dirty bomb attack, a nuclear reactor accident like in Fukushima. That's the origination of these protective action guides that EPA has had over the years. They updated them in 2013, and what they did was to expand the weakened protections to cover not just the disasters, but potentially any other accident. So it could be a radiopharmaceutical transport accident, or it could be you know, some smaller accident, but they would potentially allow these weakened protective actions that were put in place in the guise of responding to a big disaster or emergency where you couldn't keep clean levels, and then using that as a foot in the door to weaken the everyday contamination levels. So within the maximum contamination levels in drinking water be changed, and the changes that were in footnotes, some of those would allow tens of thousands of higher amounts of radioactivity in drinking water than is currently allowed. Oh, my God. There's no good justification for that. So what we ask in the meeting is whether the EPA is going to have another comment period or are they going to go ahead and make changes in the water standards. And they said, well, they're discussing it with the water office. Well, this is certainly a big concern for those of us who for actually a decade we've been fighting these protective action guide weakenings since the Bush years. Uh, under the Bush administration is when some of these suggestions were made, but wouldn't it be under the Obama administration that they actually got implemented? So the protective action guides and the weakening of our safe drinking water standards was a concern that we raised. And the other concern has to do with something that's up and coming. The early years when nuclear power was first being developed, the standards were put in place for what's allowable contamination from nuclear facilities, and it was all based on how much the nuclear weapons program emitted from its bomb testing. The original radiation standards were based on the quarterly releases because that's how the weapons community measured. They did it in quarters. Uh, the amount of radioactivity that was legal was the amount of radioactivity that they were giving off, so they set it so that they could continue their bomb program. This evolved in the regulations that the Environmental Protection Agency have in place allow for, and they pick this number of 25 millirems per year, dosed people from each of the nuclear fuel chain facilities. So the reactor, there's two reactors, you can get 50. If you've got the uranium enrichment facility, 25 from that. So 25 from each of the nuclear facilities on the, in the fuel chain is legal under the EPA. And the old measurement, the old definition of REMS or millirems, which is the dose that's calculated, this is a dose that was evolved, as I said, from the bomb program. Well, since then, in 1992, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission changed the definition of REMS and millirems to allow more radioactivity in each millirem. So it's a clever thing. 
So we've got these new kind of milliREMs, effective dose equivalent. So the number looks the same as before, but it really represents a higher dose. For two-thirds of the radionuclides measured. For some of them, the amount goes down. For some, it stays the same. But for more than half, two-thirds, the amount of radioactivity for two-thirds of the radionuclides is higher. So that's a pretty technical thing that I'm telling you here, but this is what EPA is considering. They are considering, quote-unquote, updating their allowable releases from nuclear fuel chain facilities, which includes nuclear power reactors. So it will be legal for more radioactivity. Now, when we asked about this at the uh, EPA meeting, we were told that within the next month or two, we're talking now in January of 2014, so probably in the next couple of months, the Environmental Protection Agency will put out a, a comment period on their radiation protection from nuclear facilities, 40 CFR 190, and they will, in this proposed advance notice of proposed rulemaking, give a whole series of options for how to change it and update it. So we'll look at what they're proposing and we'll put together suggestions and encourage people to comment to the EPA on increasing protections, not reducing protections. But the battle's going to be uphill on that. We will cover that in a future nuclear hot seat. But getting back to the meeting, was there any comment made or was the issue raised about the current citizen monitoring programs that are out where people are actively buying radiation monitors, coordinating with each other, and trying to get some sense of radiation on their own because they can't get it from the EPA? People who attended the meeting told the EPA that this is what is happening, that because EPA is not providing the data that people are doing it on their own and that it would be nice if the federal government, which licenses the facilities that give off the radioactivity, would actually get out there and measure it and report it. And, of course, we have concerns with how that reporting would be. This is such a complex issue. What do you think are the takeaways for our movement and what is the best way for those of us listening to back you up and support you in this work? There's a few different things. It's complicated, but on the other hand, it's really not. We've got a polluting industry that's putting out poisons into our environment, and most of us just don't want that. So I think letting our elected officials, our senators and Congress members, and the EPA directly know that we want no exposure. We want minimal exposure. We want greater protections. We want notification and honest reporting about what is out there. So we're calling for real-time monitoring, independent real-time monitoring of nuclear facilities and of radioactivity in our air, water, soil, and food. From your mouth to somebody in power's ears, and let's see what we can do to help you get there. And let's see what I can do to help all of you. <laughs> <laughs> you do that anyway all the time. Diane DiRigo, thank you so much for being my guest today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks for inviting me. Diane DiRigo from NEARS. Other participants in these meetings included the new executive director of NEARS, Tim Judson, Gretel Johnson, co-founder of Mothers Against Tennessee River Radiation, attorney Susan Hito Shapiro, and Priscilla Starr, founder of the Coalition Against Nukes, who said, The most outstanding result coming out of our D.C. meetings is that we have engaged in a process whereby we will hold the EPA and NRC fully accountable for not providing an ongoing, transparent system of radiation monitoring that lets the public know what level and what type of radioactive pollutants are in the air at all times. We have put them on notice that we want the RADnet monitors to work on a real-time basis 24-7 around the country and to also reveal exactly what is coming in from Fukushima, whatever it costs. Nuclear Hot Seat will keep you posted. Speaking of radiation, here's Radcast. This is Mimi Gurman for the Radcast Report. Radically relevant and the first of its kind. Today is Tuesday, January 28, 2014. Remember, the Radcast alert is set at 100 counts per minute. 
We're seeing radiation peak levels in many areas coming down from last week's high readings. I'm going to take you through the readings in zone clusters to get you used to understanding how we see radiation in regions. And by the way, you will soon be able to view all past RADCAST reports on RADCAST.org, though it's taking a little bit of time for me to upload all of those, so be patient, folks. Seaside, Portland, and Tenino. These are two areas in Oregon and one in southern Washington. Seaside is 33 counts per minute with a high of 60. Portland, 33 counts per minute. And Tenino is at 35 counts per minute. Seattle is at 31. Olympia at 27 and Hanford at 28. In upstate New York, levels have dropped considerably from last week. The snows tend to bring in a lot of radiation when they begin falling. As we see often, the initial precipitation brings the most radiation down from the jet stream, and then it levels off. We see the same thing with rain. That's why it is imperative, citizen readers, to use your meters at the beginning of precipitation of a rainfall or snowfall. Catch it in the very beginning stages. In Baldwinsville, New York, which is upstate New York next to Ithaca, we have counts of 34 and 42. Those are the averages with highs of 62 and 69. Those are considerably lower than last week. In the northeast, peaks are also down. And again, I'm talking about peaks, not averages. Robbinsville, New Jersey is at 44 average with a high of 68. And Upper St. Clair, which is just to the west of Philadelphia, is at 40 averaging and a high of 68. So they're both at 68 peak. Heading south. Durham and Taylor, South Carolina. Durham, North Carolina is at 32 with a high of 56, and Taylor is 37 and 62. The areas that don't seem to change much in the high averages and peaks are near the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant and the nuclear test sites in the southwest. We have Salisbury, Massachusetts, with a reader there, and those readings are always high, 52 and 80. Frederick, Wisconsin tends to be high, too, situated near a lot of nuclear power plants, 48 average with a high of 80, which is lower than last week. Spearfish, South Dakota, 49 with a high of 73, which is much lower than usual for spearfish. Happy to say that. Layton, Utah is averaging 46 with a high of 78. And Lakewood, Colorado, which is always high, is averaging at 67, which is slightly normal for them, and a high of 95. In California, we've been seeing an area called Paso Robles, uh, which has been on the higher side for a while now. That's near the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, and it gets consistently higher readings than other areas in California. So that's how we look at clusters. I'll take you on another lesson next week. Remember that our new site is up and running with more information uploaded every day. Give us some time. We'll get everything in at radcast.org. Please send us emails for what you want to see. Thanks for listening to the Radcast Report on the Nuclear Hot Seat. This is Mimi German for radcast.org. We're running a little late this week, so John Stewart, you know the rest. And my book, My Very Personal Nuclear Reaction, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is imminent in its launch. I'll let you know all the details when they're ready. Final thought. Robert Jacobs has written a trilogy of articles on fukuleaks.org dealing with how radiation makes people invisible. Link on the website. I'd read his first paragraph. Don't have time. It moved me deeply. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 28, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, New York. NukeResistor.org, Orange County Register, KPCC, Alaska Marine Science Symposium, Local Environmental Observer Network, Juno Vampire, Fairbanks Daily News Minor, KION-TV, MIT Center for International Studies, Santa Fe, New Mexican.com, Informable.com and Lucas Hickson, UPR.org, Kyoto News, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Japan Times, Pro Adam Magazine in Russia, CBS, Yori Mochizuki and Fukushima Diary, Amy Goodman and Democracy Now!, Ottawa Citizen, BayToday.ca, MirPravu.blogspot.com, JamaicaGleaner.com, NHK, TEPCO, World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Gratitude to Scott Portsline of TMI Alert, who's continuing to assist me in getting this sound on this show right. The music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Archives on iTunes or at NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog. 
Comment all you like as long as you're civil. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use. Just give credit, guys. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the...